My paranormal experiences take place in New Jersey back in the year 1985. I was frequently over my aunt and uncle's house back in the 80s quite a bit. My family and my cousin's families were very close. We did a lot of sleepovers for the weekend. At this time, I had an older sister who's three years older than me. I had a younger sister who was too young to do the traveling. She was only one. I was five. So my cousins were around my age, a little bit older, but frequently what we would do is we would play hide and seek video games. But on this particular day, we were playing hide and seek. And I specifically remember my sister and my older cousin were running around the house, around the base of the house from the foyer, which led to the right into the living room, which was like the nice room that seems to be in a lot of people's houses that you don't normally go in. And that room, it was like a big, like a big circle. That room led out into the hallway and that shortly led into the kitchen. So we're running around and I was with my other cousin, I'll call him Will. And Will is two years older than me. And you know, being little kids, we both had our blankies. And we were running around hiding from his sister and, and my sister. And frequently what we would do is we would hide behind the furniture. There was a long couch that we would hide behind quite a bit. But then when my aunt and uncle would rearrange the furniture, often we would hide behind this chair that uh, was kind of like a rocking chair. But uh, it was a good place to hide, especially if we had our blankets. We would just throw it over us and kind of just blend in. So from what I can remember, the girls were running around. So my cousin and I, we ducked behind the chair and I'm in front. I'm shorter. So I'm in front. He's behind me and he uh, doesn't say anything, but he just kind of ducks down. I feel him on my back. And all of a sudden I go from hearing my sister and my cousin running around, you know, just saying, where are you guys? And then everything just like slowed down. Like it felt like complete slow motion on like a movie. And in the doorway of this room, I look up and I'm expecting to see either my sister or my cousin. And I don't see that. I see this creature walking into the room. And it was very black, very hairy. And if you've ever seen the movie Critters, which I actually have never seen, but I've seen pictures online, it looked like the creature from that movie. I would say, I would say it was probably between three to three and a half feet tall. Um, first thing I noticed was the eyes, the eyes were like a blood red and it walked into the room, maybe a step or two. And like I said, everything's moving at a slow motion pace and I'm frozen. I'm, I'm absolutely terrified. Isn't even the word. And then the creature slowly turns its head and opens its mouth and I see just teeth, just one row on the top, one row on the bottom and razor sharp teeth. And in my five-year-old mind, I'm like, that would hurt. <laughs> that would, that would hurt to get bit by those to back up for a second. I remember that it had hands 
kind of like walked like if you've ever seen one of the old like Godzilla movies where like Godzilla's walking with his hands at like a 90 degree angle, kind of like a kangaroo. The hands were extremely short though. And it had little claws and it turned its head towards me and opened its mouth. And again, I'm focusing on the teeth and I see the eyes and then it takes one step towards me. And I don't know if I did it or if my cousin behind me had done it, but the blanket was pulled over my head. And I'm pretty sure that I did it, but I can't say 100% for sure. And then I was expecting to feel impact from this, this creature. And I felt nothing. I kept this memory with me for years and actually at one point in my 20s because it would pop up in my mind every once in a while and i just wrote it off as it was a dream since that time family grows apart everybody gets older has their own lives and i decided to mention that to my cousin will one time just just in passing just a small talk and i said hey, hey do, you, do you remember that creature that we saw and he turned ghost white and didn't say anything and ignored me and, and went on to talk to somebody else. And to me, that spoke volumes. I decided to just drop it right then and there and never mention it to, to him or anybody in my family ever again. I've told my wife about it. I've told my close group of friends about it. Most people, my wife, I think, believes me to an extent. Uh, she's not a believer really in the paranormal. But, you know, a few of my friends have told me that whether they believe me or not, it's the fear that is real, whether it was a dream or whether it was a real experience it's the fear that was 100 percent real so the other paranormal encounter i had was at the same house at my aunt and uncle's house in east brunswick and um again sleeping over my cousin's house the house i loved the house i loved being there it was not really in the woods but it definitely had a quarry in their backyard and growing up there, I just always felt like I should kind of look over my shoulder and just be very careful. Don't be stuck by myself anywhere. But I remember one time I was looking for my cousin, Will didn't know if he'd run to the bathroom or whatever. I just, I didn't, I didn't like being by myself when I was a kid. So what I remember doing is I was going down the hallway and I made a right, which led to the door of the basement. I opened the door and there's a light switch that's on the right. And again, I'm probably about like five or six years old, maybe, maybe seven. And I didn't even get a chance to turn the light on. And they had just started renovating their basement to finish it. So I go to reach for the light. And there's this, it honestly looked like a little boy. I mean, but like bald, not many features, but just this being down there that looked white. And the expression on its face was angry. I would say if it looked, if it was a boy, looked about my age, but again, looked like it was very angry had sharp teeth, no hair. I didn't notice any clothes. I really wasn't paying attention to that. I mean, the the experience was so quick because I immediately slammed the door and I went to go find my aunt. And that was pretty much it. I never really mentioned that one to anybody because I just was able to shrug it off over the years. But that first encounter with that black creature That was, I still remember that to this day as if it happened very recently.
My paranormal experiences are something that have deeply affected me and changed my life and shaped who I am. My name is John Carlson. I have had a series of strange experiences, paranormal experiences, if you would like to call them that, since I was about four years old. The strangest of which happened to me in June of 2014 in Oregon. But I'll talk a little bit about some of the experiences that I had leading up to that. But as I said, the beginning of all this began when I was about four years old. My father's job had moved the family around several times, a couple times before I was born. I came along a little later when my parents are kind of approaching middle age. My brother is 14 years older and my sister's 12 years older. So they had moved from Brooklyn, New York, where they were from originally, to Baltimore. They were in Baltimore for about 10 years, Maryland, before I was born. And then we were in Long Island, where I was born, Long Island, New York. And on my fourth birthday, we actually moved out of Long Island and a couple of days later moved into a home in Massachusetts outside of Boston in a suburb. And this is really where my experiences started to happen. We had just moved in. It was an old center hall colonial house. No history to it as far as I ever knew as far as any sort of hauntings or anything odd. I would love to go back there and speak to some of the people who have lived there since I'm sure the home has changed hands a number of times since we left. We were there for just short of five years, but I would love to know if anybody else experienced anything strange there. But we moved in. My brother had just graduated from high school a couple months earlier, and it was going to be starting at Boston College as a freshman. My sister was entering her junior year of high school, and I was, as I said, had just turned four. And so I was a little kid. My father's job had transferred us in the family again, which is why we ended up living in that area, had moved out of the New York City area. And almost immediately upon moving into this house, I began having very, very vivid dreams about these short, squat, black entities, creatures, humanoid-looking creatures. They were upright, walked on two legs. They were rather short, meter or so, three, three and a half feet, I would say, around, I guess, my size at the age of four. And they appeared at my bedside at night, would come into my room through this large closet that I had. and would come to approach my bed and there was always more than one of them, two, three of them, four of them. As I recall, it was just, they were very, very vivid nightmares. I mean, that's what my parents told me. They said they were nightmares. My mother always believed that it was because of the trauma of the move. And I guess some of the people It's a family member passed away, and I think my grandmother had a stroke, and it was all around this time that we moved to Massachusetts, and my mother seemed to think this affected me, and that was what caused these dreams of mine, these nightmares. I don't recall that. To me, I believe I was too young that any of that really affected me much, and from what I remember, I was kind of excited to be in a new house, in a new bedroom, and we had a nice yard with a swing set in it. And I remember being sort of excited about moving. I didn't really feel that as if it was some traumatic event that would have caused these nightmares that I had. Nevertheless, they were very, very vivid, and they began almost immediately upon moving into this home. And always these same beings, they were very stocky and powerfully built, short, and they didn't have much of a neck. They had eyes that were either reflective or sort of backlit or glowing. They had kind of a broad, flattish-looking face, not like a snout, but at all. I mean, more of a, a flat nose and kind of a wide mouth. And they were entirely black. I don't recall if they had some sort of hair or fur on them or if they just had a more of a black hide. 
if they did have any kind of hair, it wasn't long and shaggy. It was always these same things that I used to see in my bedroom. They would approach my bed. I'd be basically paralyzed, unable to move. I would try to scream and nothing would come out. And this would be several times a week. And this lasted for almost the five years that we lived in that house. We moved in about the end of August and we moved out the middle of July, five summers later. And these were very disturbing events. And my parents, understandably, thought that they were nightmares. And because it all began to happen, I never had any prior issues with this when we were living at our old home in Long Island. This all began immediately after moving into this home in Massachusetts. My parents thought they were just nightmares and that it was something to do with the fact that we moved and it was unsettling to me in some way. As I said, I don't really remember it feeling that way as a kid. I hadn't started school yet. I didn't have any real friends. I was only just turned four. So I was mostly just sort of attached to my mother at that age. So I didn't really feel that it was anything that was troubling the move. So this continued. It was very intense the first few years. I mean, I think it became a little frequent, a little bit less intense, but I think these nightly visitations continued for just about the whole five years that we lived in this house. And again, whenever we tell my parents about it, they would always dismiss it as being nightmares, which I wouldn't expect them to say anything else. I have children of my own. And if they told me that, I would probably say they were just nightmares. And I'm sure they probably what they thought too. But I remember one night actually coming out of the bathroom. I had to get up in the middle of the night. I guess I drank too much water before bed and I had to go over to use the bathroom. And it was a center hall. So the bathroom was at the top of the steps and my room was just off to one side. So I came out the room, went to the bathroom. I came out and I just about bumped into one of these things that used to come into my room in the hallway. (laughs) And it almost had a look of surprise on its face. And I remember the next morning saying to my mother, mom, I saw one of those things. I saw it. I wasn't asleep. I wasn't in my bed. I went to the bathroom and I came out of the bathroom and I went and walked into the hallway and almost bumped into it. And, you know, it looked at me and I looked at it and it turned around and it ran in back into my room. And then you know, when I, <laughs> I opened the door, it wasn't there. And she said, well, you were sleepwalking. So <laughs> I really didn't get any. After a while, I just stopped telling them about it. But because I always got the same answer that it was a nightmare or sleepwalking, but they were very, very vivid, very terrifying. And always they would, when they would approach me, I would try to scream. I couldn't move. I was basically paralyzed and no sound would come out of my throat. And it was very disturbing. And there were some other incidents that happened. I think I may have even seen these things again, outside the home on on a different occasion, but In the years since then, I've tried to convince myself that those were just really were just nightmares. And that seems like the logical explanation. And I've read about night terrors and I've read about, I think it's called being in a hypnopompic state where people have these waking nightmares where they can't move and they're paralyzed and they see these visions and these nightmare visions. And I understand that. I mean, and perhaps that's what they were, but I have reason to believe that that's not the case, that these things were actually some sort of entities. When I got a bit older, you know, I had a, developed a kind of a fascination with anything kind of strange and paranormal. Or even outside of that, I was always interested in anything unusual, whether it was UFOs or ghosts or Bermuda Triangle. I used to read like all the Charles Berlitz books, I believe, and a couple of the other authors I used to read a lot of. But I came across when I was in my, I guess I was in my teens, books by Missing Time. And the other one was what, uh, Ducted or what is it? I'm trying to remember the name of the other book. It was by Bud Hopkins, who you're probably familiar with. He was an artist, modern artist, pretty successful one. I had a girlfriend who's had an original painting of one in her home of Bud Hopkins, but he was also a UFO investigator and he did a lot of work with people who have had these alien abduction experiences. So I began to read 
his books. And I said, wow, a lot of this, except for the description of the beings, the ETs or whatever you want to call them. Other than that, because mine were not skinny and gray, they were very, you know, as I said, squat and powerfully built and they were black and that's sort of an animal like quality to them, even though they were seemed intelligent at the same time, but nothing like what Hopkins described in his books. But there were a lot of similarities as far as them appearing at people's bedsides and people describing not being able to move or being able to cry out and make a sound. And I just thought that was very interesting. I said, well, you know, there seems to be a lot of similarities here between my experiences and what Hopkins wrote in his books, but didn't really get me any further as far as figuring out what all this stuff meant. And as I said, when we moved out of that house and we moved then to northeastern New Jersey, back to the New York City area, again, my father's job transferred us here, transferred the family. At that point, my brother and sister were older and they were out of the house. So it was just my parents and I. Those experiences stopped, but I had some other odd things. And it's not as if this sort of thing happens to me constantly, but periodically throughout my life, I've had some odd things, things that are not easily explainable. And one of them was when I was in junior high school, I was maybe 14 years old. I had a period of missing time where I was coming home from school, walking home the same way that I walked every day. It was pretty much a straight line. It was one long road. and then a couple of quick turns and I was at my house. So I was walking down this one road the same way that I walked each day. And as I approached the intersection, first of all, before I get into that, everything was oddly quiet, very muted. And this is a busy suburb in New Jersey. It was, you know, we're in the, you know, basically kind of a bedroom community of New York City. A lot of people worked in Manhattan, commute in. It was a town of about 27,000, not a small town. And it was around three. I don't know if I left school a little bit early that day. I mean, a little bit late. Might have been a little bit past three o'clock, but I think that maybe just because everything was weirdly quiet. And that's a very busy time of the day because there was the high school that I passed through that area. The high school is nearby. There was an elementary school. There were two elementary schools nearby and all getting out around the school at that time. So there was a lot of students walking home, parents picking up little kids sometimes. So just, it was a kind of a busy time of the day, but it was weirdly silent that day, as I recall. And I was walking towards this intersection, same intersection I crossed each day. And as I approached it, and there was traffic light on the corner and a couple of shops at the same corner, it seemed as if it was receding into the distance as I was walking toward it, which is not what happens when you walk towards things. The objects become larger as you get closer to them. And they appear to be getting further away from me. And at that point, I have a big blank spot in my memory. I don't remember anything. I never reached that intersection as far as I know. And the next thing I know, I woke up in a, still walking on my feet. I wasn't laying in a ditch or anything or at the side of the road. I was still walking and I was still walking in the same direction, north to south, except I was well behind where I started from. So it's not as if I somehow got turned around and kind of walked in the other direction. I was still walking in a southerly direction, but I was a couple miles away from where I had lost my memory and further back from where the school was. So I was in sort of in a different part of town and suddenly found myself there. And I woke up and did walking, didn't know how I got where I was. And I don't know how long I had lost my memory or however you want to phrase it. And I was very disoriented. And kind of frightened because I didn't know how I got where I was. I didn't know what happened. And my mother pulled up in her car and flung open the car door. And she said, John, are you okay? And I said, yeah. I said, I don't know how I got here, though. And 
I climbed into the car and I said, how did you know where I was? Because first of all, my parents didn't pick me up from school. My mother, this was the late seventies. Kids didn't have cell phones back then. And parents basically, as long as we showed up for dinner, you know, there was no problem. My parents, you know, if I didn't come home at three o'clock, my parents would assume that I was, or my mom would assume that I was out, went over a friend's house or stayed at school for something. Or you know, parents were a lot less nervous back then. As long as we came home at night, it's uh, by dinner time, we were, everything was fine. So she wouldn't normally have come looking for me. It was, the weather was fine. It was a nice day. And the fact that she found me where I was, which was nowhere near the school <laughs> was a really good explanation for that. I was like, and that's why I asked her, I said, how did you know where to find me? And she said, I was home. And she said, I heard a very clear voice saying, go get John. He needs you. And I jumped in my car and, and she said, I just knew where you were. I said, well, you know, how, how did you know? She goes, I don't know how I knew. I just knew. I heard a voice said, go get John. He needs you. And she said, I just knew where you were. So strange is <laughs> another odd experience. And if my mother had not been involved, I might have said, well, I had some sort of maybe I have no history of seizures or anything like that. And it was, you know, I've never been a drug taker. And it was before I started drinking beer. And <laughs> And I've never had anything like that happen to me, even when I drink beer. So, you know, there's no real good explanation for it. And it hasn't happened to me since. It was just that one time. But it wasn't any kind of substance-induced issue or any kind of medical issue as far as what I think. If it was, it was a one-off thing that never has happened to me again. But the fact that my mother seemed to have been contacted or <laughs> had this, at least it was a very strong premonition, but she always described it as a, a voice that she heard saying, go get John, he needs you. And she just knew where I was. So it was strange. Speaking of my mother, she had a lot of kind of odd experiences herself. I think part of what I have is hereditary. I don't know anyone else in my mother's family or her parents or grandparents had any these sorts of experiences, but my mom definitely did. Not quite like mine. She used to have very she used to have very strong premonitions and precognitive dreams. They would almost always come to pass what she would dream about. They were usually not good things. It was always somebody being usually getting sick or dying and she didn't like them. My mother was pretty straightforward, traditional person. She was not into anything. Yeah, certainly was not into anything occult or paranormal or, you know, she was just, you know, first generation, very staunch Catholic and you know, first generation American. Her parents came here from Sicily and, and not somebody dabbled in anything a culture weird. And she did not like these experiences. My mother was a very happy, upbeat person. She was always singing or laughing. That was my mom. And, but sometimes I would see she would have this look on her face where this kind of concerned, you know, not her usual happy look. And I would say, what's the matter, mom? And she'd say, oh, I had another one of my witchy dreams. That's what she would always call them, her witchy dreams. And she didn't like them. She didn't think of it as being a gift or something that she asked for or hoped for. She would have these disturbing dreams and they would come to fruition more often than not. She was almost 100% accurate and they were generally bad stuff. I mean, I had a, two uncles that happened to pass away on the same night and she was having these terrible dreams about them for over a year before they died. And that's a whole story in and of itself. But it was this, these were, this was not anything my, my mother really liked very much. And a couple of times she saw, she saw deceased relatives, she saw her elder sister who had passed away. And she returned one day. She said, to, my mother said she was up in her bedroom. She said she turned around and there was my aunt, my aunt Jane, who was the eldest in the family of, she had a 
four sisters and two brothers, my mom. And there was Aunt Jane, and she was sitting at the edge of the bed. And she said to my mother in a very stern, kind of big sisterly voice, she told her to call their brother that he needs to hear from you or something. And she said, call buddy, he needs you. And before my mother, and then she basically just you know, disappeared. <laughs> and then a moment later, before my mother even was able to call my uncle, the phone rang and it was him and the younger of my mom's two older brothers with whom she was very, very close. And you know, he had some bad personal news or his daughter, my cousin had breast cancer. She's fine now. This was over 25 years ago. She's alive and well today. and They caught it early enough, but obviously my uncle was very upset. And also his wife had passed away from breast cancer not long before. So, you know, doubly upsetting for him. So this was just all of a sudden my mom's sister was there. She said, go call our brother. He needs you. And ring the phone rings, you know, even before she could call him. And there's my uncle. So this sort of thing seems to, as far as those entities, I don't, my mother never had anything like that happen. If she did, she didn't tell me about it, but it seems there's some sort of maybe a psychic sensitivity to the, this sort of thing, or we're predisposed to it, I suppose. And I have read about these things being passed along in the family. So I thought I'd mention that, but I've seen some strange, odd things. It didn't make a lot of sense. It's a, a very large, too large bird. <laughs> right just around the corner from my parents' house, I was over there visiting them, I think. And I just turned the corner. I saw this enormous black bird. I mean, it was entirely black. It had very, very, very large wings. And it was just... It was low enough that I think I got a pretty good sense of scale on this thing because it was only maybe just above the telephone poles. It wasn't like it's way up in the sky. So, you know, the trees and the homes were in the background. So, and it was ridiculously large. And now we do occasionally see some turkey vultures in the area, but this was much too large to be a turkey vulture. So that was odd. And... Yeah, I've had a couple of kind of long distance sightings of unidentified objects, nothing up close and personal, but I've seen some things that definitely were not moving like a normal aircraft. That's happened to me a couple of times. And another incident, well, just maybe about three years ago this winter, I saw some kind of mysterious canine in my yard. I'm actually writing about this on my blog. The blog I have that I write on is called paranormalist.com, P-A-R-A-N-O-R-M-A-L-I-S-T, paranormalist.com. And yeah, so I saw this really large canine in our backyard. I was about to let my dog out. I got up in the morning. She wanted to go out and we had had a bunch of snow the night before. We had a pretty good snowfall and it was about 6.30 or 7 in the morning and I was about to let the dog out into the backyard so she could take care of business. And I saw this big, it was much too large to be a red fox, but it had a long reddish coat, kind of like a red fox. But the snout was more, wasn't as pointed didn't have a fox-like face, more like a coyote or a wolf, except for the coat was long and red. And I've, as far as I know, I've never seen or heard of any wolf or a coyote like that. And I was about to let her out and I grabbed her and shut the door because I didn't want her to go out with that creature out there. And it was trying, and we do get some, even though we're in the burbs here in Northeast New Jersey, 20 miles outside of New York City, we do get some wildlife around. And there has been, we do occasionally see coyotes. So that's kind of where my mind jumped to, except that it had this unusual red coat. I bent down and I grabbed the dog so she wouldn't run out there. And I you know, shut the door. And when I looked up, it was gone. But it just kind of ran right across my line of vision from the right side of the lawn to the left. And I went outside to look to see where it might have gone. And my yard isn't real big. There's nowhere it really could have been hiding. And I saw the tracks. And 
they sort of began and ended. Our yard is fenced. So it would have had to have jumped the fence and landed in the snow, which would have made a mark in the snow, would have made an imprint. And the snow was just pristine. I mean, it had snowed the night before and nobody had been out there walking in the yard. This was first thing in the morning. And there was no sign of it where it might have jumped over and landed. Or and then I was thinking, well, could it have burrowed underneath? But that would have made, you know, the ground and the snow would have been disturbed as well. And I don't know how it would have gotten in. There was no sign of it, how it just all of a sudden the tracks appeared. And then they go across the yard and then they approach the yard bordering the fence, bordering the next yard over and they just disappear. And, and then I'm looking, I'm like, well, it would have had to have leapt over the fence into the next yard because it's going from, you know, horizontally from one side of the yard to the next. And then there's the fence. So it would have had to have jumped over the fence. And again, it would have left the imprint and mark in the snow when it landed into the new fallen snow there. And there was no mark, just the prints begin and end. And in the time it took me to bend over to grab my dog to prevent her from running outside with this thing, it was gone. But I looked at the imprints of the paw prints of these things and they were large. I mean, they were bigger than my dogs. And my dog is a good-sized coonhound shepherd mix. She's about 75 pounds. She's not a small dog. And they were a good deal larger than hers. I'm like, well, this is, you know, this also looks big even for a coyote because coyote's not especially large. And we don't get wolves around here. And also that it had this strange coloring to its coat. So that was a strange kind of anomalous hiding that I had, but there was no physical evidence. I took pictures of the prints. So that was another kind of weird experience that I've had a lot. I, maybe I should get on to the main one that I guess we were you know, supposed to talk about. One other, I saw an unusually large man on a New York City subway. I'll just describe that quickly, but this was another strange thing. I went in for a job interview in Manhattan, New York, and I had just finished the interview. I got on the subway to take me to the Port Authority bus station where I was going to take the bus back home to Jersey. And I'm on the subway platform, kind of waiting for the subway with all the other commuters. And there's this guy who was freakishly big. I mean, I used to work with a guy who was seven feet tall, and I'm six foot two. I'm a pretty big guy. And when you're six two, you're not usually used to looking up at people. And so it was a weird one. I used to work with a seven foot guy because I was always looking up at him and I don't like it that much. <laughs> and I, used, I really don't like looking way up at people. It's just odd. So, but I know what it's like to be around a person. I used to work with this guy every day and I know what it's like to be around somebody who's unusually tall like that. I mean, this guy was a solid seven foot. He was like, you know, I think I came up to maybe his, his shoulder or his chin or so. The guy that was on the subway platform had to have been a foot taller than that. I mean, I came up to, I was close enough that I could see where my head lined up. I was standing really pretty close to him within a few feet. And I think my head came up to his elbow, perhaps, <laughs> maybe not much higher, kind of lower chest, upper abdomen. And I'm like, this man has got to be a foot and a half to two feet taller than me. And I honestly think he was over eight feet tall. And he was very well dressed. He had a nice woolen overcoat. It was winter time, holding this rather large briefcase because he had enormous, you know, he was he was huge. Everything <laughs> but he looked massive. I mean you could see his chest and his neck and his shoulders, even though he's wearing this overcoat and a suit and tie. And I'm like, I've never seen anybody anywhere close to being not just tall, but massively built. I mean, he had have been more than twice as wide as me. I lift the weights. I'm pretty broad. I uh, kind of take after my dad's side. And they were a bunch of big Swedes. And <laughs> the weird thing was nobody was looking at this guy. Nobody paid any attention to him. 
And I'm like, how are people not staring at this dude? He's huge. I mean, it's one thing to see somebody that's exceptionally tall, but he was massive. He was like, I wrote about this too, again, on my blog, The Paranormalist. I said he was basically like the Incredible Hulk in a business suit. He was a massive, massive guy. Nobody seemed to be paying any attention to him. And eventually we got on the subway together and I was trying not to stare at him, but he caught me looking at him. <laughs> he caught me and I felt embarrassed. I'm like, oh man, it's like this poor guy. He's probably so sick of people staring at him like he's some like circus freak. And I'm looking at this guy. He catches me and I kind of looked away and I looked up and I see he's still staring at me. And I kind of smiled <laughs> like apologetically and he gave me this really warm smile back, kind of like, don't worry about it. And or, that's how I took it. It just had a very kind, seems a very kind face and not intimidating at all for such a gigantically massive guy. And he almost had this kind of almost somewhat holy aura about him. I felt very at ease when he smiled at me like that. And he actually really looked like my uncle, oddly enough. <laughs> he looked like my that uncle. Uh, he was one of the two uncles that passed away on the same night, Uncle Vinny. And he was you know, kind of a olive-skinned Italian or Sicilian-looking guy. Just huge. And just, it wasn't until afterward that I began to think, it was like, you know, I know how New Yorkers are. They're pretty jaded. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you could be on fire and they'd be, you know, probably not even glance over at you so i was thinking boy but it's like how do you not stare at this guy because he was you know a physical anomaly he was uh, freakish and a few years later after this my neighbor and friend he has two sons around the same age as my two sons and we were talking we decided we were going to take our boys into new york city to the javits center for the annual auto show which is a big deal Every year, like thousands and thousands of people show up for this. It's always jam packed. And we figured we'd take the kids into the city to see the auto show. There were these two guys walking through the crowd, very, very tall, extremely tall guys, stood out above the crowd. Two young, like I, I assume they might have been basketball players or just unusually tall guys. <laughs> people were staring at these guys. Now, again, New Yorkers were in New York City, you know, and not far from the subway station I was at. But these guys were getting all kinds of looks as they were going by. And then one woman came up to them, to these two young men and said, excuse me, how tall are you guys? And they kind of laughed and they're like, my friend is 6'11 and I'm 7'1. And I heard him say, and she's like, wow. <laughs> you know, so these guys are getting, you know, stared at and commented on. and. The guy a couple of years earlier on the subway train was much larger than these guys, not just taller, but he was, you know, triple their width and probably the weight. He was humongous and nobody was looking at him. And I started, it dawned on me after a while. I was like, maybe I'm the only person who saw this guy, which, you know, <laughs> could mean I'm crazy, I guess, <laughs> but I've seen things. My point is I've seen some things that, you know, I think other people haven't seen. And I have heard of people saying similar things, but I got to think it was like, nobody paid any attention to this Goliath on the subway station platform and the subway car barely fit in the subway car. <laughs> His head was bowed to keep from hitting the ceiling. And he had to like turn sideways to get in and through the doors. And I'm like, am I the only person able to see him or meant to see him? I mean, was he a person or some sort of angelic being perhaps? Because I have heard of people who have had encounters with angels, if you believe in that sort of thing. I do. Not necessarily every story I hear, but I do believe in angels. I'm you know, religious that way, I guess. And I've heard them described as being very large and tall and powerfully built. And I'm like, boy, I wonder if that was some sort of archangel or angel. I don't, I don't know. Odd though. He certainly, <laughs> certainly was the biggest human or person <laughs> that I've ever seen. So 
I had that experience. If you've had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us by going to myparax.com. That's my para e x dot com. Thanks for listening.